Hi, Sally. Hello, hello. Oh, what a pleasure this is to have you on the podcast. It truly is. Thank you so much for coming along today. Thank you for having me. It's as much a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Oh, well, I, I feel very blessed that we've crossed paths because you actually, um, you sent me a really nice note via Instagram a few months ago when you'd listened to one of my podcasts. I think it was the Past Lives one. Yeah, it was with Julie Ryan. Yeah, yeah. And um, I was so touched. It was so lovely of you. And then I started looking at your little videos and I just thought, oh, this woman explains things in a way that I can just grasp, you know, complicated things in such a simple, warm way that I just want to everyone to, to, to hear what you have to say, because it's so, so important. Um, your book, Get Your Sparkle Back, I honestly, it's been my constant companion for the past three weeks. <laughs> oh. And do you know, Sally, it actually it actually didn't feel like reading a book. It felt like going out for a drink with a really close girlfriend mm -hmm. who just sat me down and said, look, love, here's a few things that you need to know in such a lovely, warm, accessible way. So I now feel, though I've never spoken to you before, I actually feel like I'm catching up with a girlfriend. Oh, good, good. I'm <laughs> so glad because, you know, for the past decade, I've read all these sciencey books on women's health you know huge tomes going through every single hormone and you know all the way it interacts with our bodies it's honestly taken me that long to to realize it's been over complicated for women and no wonder we just press the you know escape button go to our doctor and take whatever pill when actually our health and the foundation of it and the way our bodies work is actually very simple, very cyclical and easy to grasp once we're given the tools and the language that we understand as opposed to something from a medical textbook. So it's really, I'm so glad that it spoke to you in the way I wanted it to. It did. It completely did. And I mean, I'm a functional medicine health coach, so obviously I was familiar with, with the thing with the cycles, but I have to say I'd never really fully grasped the different times of the month for a woman and what that meant. I mean, I kind of on some level had, but this time I fully internalized it and got it. So I'm going to start by asking you about this. You've mentioned cycles. What, what is the importance of cycles, particularly for women? So cycles and understanding that we have a cyclical nature, once we grasp that as women, it's like a key I believe that unlocks the secrets to your mental and physical health, but should never have been secrets. So that idea that we're just hormonal messes, right? We're just, we we're fine and then we have an explosive mood and then we cry and then we're fine on a diet and then one day we're really, really hungry. That's the story we've been given as women. We're just these kind of out of control messes. And Unless you understand that that is completely, completely wrong. And that is the story of a woman trying to be a man. So a male hormonal cycle is 24 hours. It's the same every day. And we say it's very much like the sun. So the sun comes up and the sun goes down each day. That is the male hormonal cycle. And that is the way women have been asked to live. We've been asked to be the same within 24 hours every single day. And that's what most women have been trying to do for at least the last couple of hundred years. And that's why we're at a point in time where women's mental and physical health is just so, so tough because women are trying to exist within a structure that wasn't built for them. So women have a 28 day cycle. We are like the moon. And just in the same way you see the moon, sometimes it's like this bright ball of light in the sky. They're the days that we feel great and we can get all the tasks done and all we feel like even our hair is good that day. That's what the moon does and it shines the light on everyone. And then what happens with the moon? It's light decreases and sometimes it 
you can't even see it in the sky. And that's the same with women. We have these hormones that sometime enable us over a month to be this bright, shining ball of energy. And at other times, as our hormones wax and wane, just like the moon, sometimes we have no light to give anyone else. And that's completely normal. And we're meant to have that time to reflect and recharge. But it's a problem if you've been told, no, no, you should have the same level of energy, the same ability to help people to, you know, invest in your business to exercise. And so women think, well, what's wrong with me? We haven't been Mm. told that our energy, our mood, our appetite, very predictably waxes and wanes each month. And once we understand at what point in our month, we feel that drop or that lift of hormones, which enables us to be better at some things, and other things feel a bit more of a struggle at that time, we start to realize that we're not this mess. We're these magical, cyclical creatures who go through basically like the seasons of the earth each month. We have a spring, a summer, an autumn, and a winter. And each of those seasons have gifts, and they have things that we need to be aware of because we'll find certain things harder. Yeah, and I love the fact that you say that each of the seasons has its gift because, you know, at first glance, menstruating doesn't seem like so much of a gift but um the way you describe it and I I think it'll be a nice place to start actually with with that phase of the month is actually is is a lovely spiritual way of 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 talking about it so tell us tell us about the, the menstruating part of that cycle so yeah again it's it's like one of the biggest crimes that's ever been done to women by saying this is the time that is the most awful, the most shameful, the most kind of horrendous part of a woman's month or a part of her life. And actually, again, that that message is only has only been around for the last few hundred years. And even in religious texts, people have misinterpreted. So in a lot of kind of ancient religious texts, there's the idea of a woman being sent out into the desert. And people have, in modern religions, they've said, oh, that's because a woman was dirty or unclean. In fact, it's when the woman is at her most spiritual, because our brain chemistry changes during that time of the month. The left and right hemisphere, our logic and our creativity are the most connected in our brain, which means we're the most intuitive, the most analytical. We have the most ability to realise what's not working in my life, what's not working in the world. And if you believe in God source a higher power it's the time when your brain is most activated to get those almost supernatural downloads so women were sent out into the desert and away from the community not because they were dirty and shameful but because these ancient communities knew that it's when women were their most powerful to hear from God and to bring that wisdom then back into the community wow that's just huge, isn't it? So this idea of the red tent, mm. yeah, where women would kind of sit it out. Exactly. And um, yeah, a, a red tent, uh, it was called, you know, uh, the, the the moon lodge in kind of Navajo Indian culture. And women would be there and they would commune with other women and they would kind of serve other women. And you think, can you imagine the situation, if you, when you were on your period, actually that was the time when your other neighbours, friends, family, they just dropped in around because they knew your energy was lower. And you just, you literally just stayed in bed and journaled like this kind of godly queen who is getting these downloads and reflecting and going, okay, why has my business not worked this month? Why has my health been a bit cranky? Why is my relationship? And you were just in calmness as your body is going through this huge energetic release of blood, of cleansing. You would just be able to sit there and come back into your power after you've had this month of activity and things like that, that time of rest and stillness, which your low energy and your you have very little natural ability or inclination to be around other people. That is given to you to protect you and to guide you to take some time for yourself. However, again, that's very inconvenient to a male run world that decides that women show up every day just as they are. They need to be as happy, as perky, as made up, doing the same tasks, as productive. It doesn't work for women's physical or mental health. Yeah. So what you're saying, Sally, is that nature almost 
gave us this regular break in the month where we should stop doing, 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 mm. um, chasing after helping other people and, and our things to do list. Mm. And this proper break where mm. we where we just go quiet, um, as you say, like like winter, and we mm. just quieten and, and focus on our, our inner world. Mm. And I mean, which of us ever learned that? I mean, that's <laughs> it's news to everyone. I and know. yet this is this this ancient uh, what you're saying is that this, this was actually people knew this thousands of years ago. Yeah, it was. It's, wow. it's our it's our blueprint for female hormonal health, mental and physical, because every woman I interact with is exhausted. Every woman is longing for a break. Every woman looks at her calendar and there's not even a weekend she's not doing stuff. And when there's that free day or that free couple of days when no one else is in the house, you know that deep exhale that her body brings yeah. to even have an hour on her own and oh she yeah she was meant to have have that every month and so you take that out you know we, women nature knew that women are natural nurturers and givers yeah. and it's got out of balance because we over nurture and we over give everything friends family pets business and women are burning out and nature as the kind of um safety barrier you know you think about red red is the color of stopping that red blood is to bring that awareness of like this is your time to stop this is the danger zone that if you don't stop you are bleeding you are meant to take the same care as you would for someone who was bleeding from their head you're meant to take that same care for yourself but because we've had this message we cover it up we hide the periods even in in adverts it's blue blood not red you know we don't we don't want anyone seeing that awful red blood or thinking you know that women should be bleeding and stopping and resting so we have tampon adverts that show women roller skating and playing tennis which is the opposite of what we should be doing on our periods I love roller skating and playing tennis you won't catch me doing it on my period <laughs> <laughs> it's true isn't it it's all about you know use this brand of tampon so you can carry on you know running a marathon or whatever it is that you want to do in your busy, busy life, you know, all active and wearing a little mini skirt, um, playing netball. And that's been the whole message. And I guess it's the absolute reverse of what nature intended. Yeah, what nature intended and what's best for women's health. That message is so dangerous. That message that we ignore menstruation, that we ignore hormonal problems. And we just, you know, the phrase that haunts me with most women I work with and lots of women I see is you just I know crack you on say, crack on <laughs> you just crack on yes and it's yeah. like actually you're not meant to crack up do you if someone else is bleeding do you just tell them to get up and crack on you know and like I said it's there's a reason it's blood there's a reason it's blood and not you know and something else like sweat or something that we can just easily wipe away it's because we are meant to say this is my time that I am meant to care for me in the same way I would care for anything else that is bleeding. And once a month, this is my time. Even, even just on the first few days of your period, if you can just slightly increase your rest, if you can just make sure that those dinners are in the freezer or those are, that one of those nights is the time you have your takeaway or you absolutely ensure you get that bath, some of those small tweaks will just help your body rebalance and reset and remind it that it's worthy of that rest after a full month of giving out and not having any rest or respite or reflection yeah that's really really powerful because who would do that you know if say a woman was going to be leaving her kids for a week to say have an operation hostel then they'd cook things to put in the freezer so that the kids could you know stick them in the microwave whatever but but you'd never think of doing that for yourself to give yourself a bit of a break from cooking. And it takes a lot of energy for the body, doesn't it, to shed that lining? Huge, huge amount yeah. of energy. And it's why you feel that dip start before your period, that dip in energy. Your, your body is using that energy. Like you said, that womb lining has thickened and it's going to shed that. And that's a huge mm -hmm. release from your body that takes a huge amount of energy. And because that's not acknowledged or um, kind of revered, you know, like I'm so in awe of women having these periods every month. I'm like, what your body does is amazing. And we've been taught not to talk about it. 
you know and it's yeah. it's really to the detriment like you said if if a woman is going into hospital she does the things she needs to and it's the message is don't wait till you're going into hospital you know that that's my story I became very ill from hormonal issues because I'd ignored them for 10 years and now it's my duty to my body to not get to that stage again you know yeah. th there's there's a reason that the the serious diseases start coming to women in their late 40s, 50s, because they've ignored those signs and symptoms of their body for a good couple of decades saying, I need a rest. I need at some point in the month for you to slow down. I need at some point for you to pick me instead of just think you're the servant of everybody around you. You know, it gives me goose pimples when you say that I need you to pick me. My, you know, my body saying, I need you to pick me for once. And, and in my book, I say that that's what PMT is. PMT stands for pick me today. Yeah. When that rage is there, when that mood is there, when that desperation is there, that PMT is saying, pick me today, not everyone else. Stop pretending, you know, that actually it's more important that you do this and that. And Every other day we do that. But this phase, this PMT is here to say, pick me today. I need more rest. I need someone mm -hmm. else to cook dinner. Even if it's beans on toast, I don't care. I yeah. need five minutes on my own. Yeah. You know, these, these symptoms have a, have a root meaning of our body trying to get our attention and ask us to do something. Yeah. And even, I mean, when you mentioned there beans on toast, we, our body wants us to eat differently at different times of the month. So women feeling that they do want to eat a bit more carby stuff is actually... Perfect. It's, it's fine, perfect. isn't it? It's yeah, it's, it's, it's perfect and it's how it's meant to be. And again, yeah. this world has been set up for men and for their hormonal cycle. And so any woman that's on a diet or goes to a diet club where they say, every day you eat this, you eat this, you eat this... You're setting yourself up for failure because, again, there's this cyclical pattern. We don't eat the same amount in summer or the same types of food as we do in winter. It's very clear to us. Like no one craves a nice light salad and an icy water in winter because that's what the season is. The season has that effect on our body. Yeah. And those hormonal seasons during the month are the same. So there's a time where your hormones, as the estrogen rises, that suppresses your appetite. So you naturally crave less food. And then with it, when that estrogen starts dropping, your appetite increases, not because you're a greedy, awful woman who can't stick to her diet, but because your body is saying, I'm about to do something very energy intensive. We've got a period coming up. I need some more energy. Carbs would be great right now because I need, you know, that's that would be a good immediate fuel source for me. You've suppressed them throughout the month for your diet but now's the time to enjoy it. Add in some potatoes and your sweet potatoes and some sourdough bread. And we're meant to enjoy that shift. You know, I think for all the years, I tried to have these strict diets and the this idea that, oh, you take that out of your diet for ages, or this is, there's such a joy in welcoming certain foods in at different times of the month, knowing it's pure nourishment, not you being, like I said, greedy or unable to stick to a meal plan. Yeah. And there's such a difference in approach in thinking, you know, my period's coming, I'm going to make some beautiful um, spiced roasted sweet potato wedges, whatever it is, because mm. I'm, I'm, that's what I feel like eating. Then when we just let ourselves get to that point of being, as most women are, so out of touch with, with their own body. And then it's just, I mean, a lot of women I see, and I'm sure you, you have this as well um with the people who coach sally are just gorging on bars of dairy milk um sitting on a zoom call and they haven't had lunch because they're too busy because their zoom calls are back to back and then there's the whole self-loathing and and so on and on it goes and mm. and what you're talking about i think is just the polar opposite of, of what most women end up doing yeah, it, it's like I said, it, it's making sure you know that you you can have that dairy milk, but have it at the right time for your body. Or, yeah. you know, like I said, like the things that women kind of um, have to give them a, a quick energy boost, things like that, or, or as their treat, the wine, the chocolate or things like that. 
it's really inflammatory to your body. And that inflammation mm. increases your risk of all sorts of diseases, it imbalances your hormones. That's okay. I'm not saying, you know, that the biggest thing is most women, when I start speaking to them, as they say, please don't take that out of my life. They have so yeah. little pleasure and things in their life that to take their wine or to take their chocolate seems cruel. So I say to them, okay, we keep it in, but we might change the chocolate to this brand or we might change the wine to, you know, one glass instead of four a night. But what I will make you do is I will make you enjoy that moment. So you won't be on a phone call stuffing that, mm. you know, chocolate in. You won't be screaming at the kids making dinner as you down that wine. You will take those moments as if they are the most beautiful ritual to you, even mm. if you need to shut the door in your bedroom for five minutes and you will eat that chocolate and drink that wine as if it's like a health elixir. Yeah. And that <laughs> moment of calm yeah. will help negate the inflammation that that thing would have brought to your body. So have yeah. it, but do not double down on the inflammation by having it in a stressful way and having it as the only thing in your life that brings you pleasure and joy and mm. comfort. Gosh, there's so much there, Sally, because women clients have often said to me, when they talk about the particular things that they eat, whether it's, you know, chocolate biscuits, whatever, and they'll often say, Susie, this is the only thing nice in my life. The only thing I have. Mm -hmm. um, and it's heartbreaking to hear, but I think it's important to acknowledge that that's where a lot of women are. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I love what you've said about the chocolate. In fact, um, you have a beautiful description in the book of being in the you being in the bath and treating yourself to is it two booja booja? Oh, I love my booja booja <laughs> chocolates. They are my divine. <laughs> I used to buy them, and do you know what, Sally? Actually, they are quite expensive, aren't they? They and are. I, I used to kind of like eat them within a day, and I was like, you really can't carry on buying these. But actually, I'm going to go back to buying them if you inspired me. But you describe beautifully being in the bath and really savoring each bite, even before you took a bite. It was like a ritual, as yeah. you said, and this was like a whole embodied experience. And my mother-in-law just bought me or asked some really posh chocolates from London. And I kind of thought, you know what, I'm going to take one of these. I think it was, it was like a tiramisu chocolate. It was a gorgeous, like beautiful wrap <laughs> and everything. And I really sat and it wasn't in the bath, but it was just, you know, in the garden and just really slowly savoring. And it's a very different experience, Perfect. isn't it? From just it walking is. down a Twix. Well, one of those, one of those brings you health and life and the other one affects yeah. your health. So yeah. one of those brings your body the message that you are worthy, you are loved, you are calm in this, this moment belongs to you. That, that idea of romancing yourself, you know, we've been brought up being told, oh, well, you wait for a man to romance you and we've watched our, and it's like, we have been, so much of our power has been taken away when we, we wait for other people to do that. You buy yourself those expensive chocolates and you take that time as if you've been gifted it. And you, like you said, you have those truffles and you sit and you enjoy it. And honestly, that would, the, the idea of that pleasure releases nitric oxide in your body. When you think of pleasure or experience something pleasurable and that nitric oxide does everything from it's anti-inflammatory, it's antiviral, it, it's what it's protective against heart disease, all these things that we want a pill for. And we can have that just by bringing pleasurable thoughts and pleasurable experiences into our daily lives in these mini moments. Wow. We don't have to wait for the spa break once a year. Yes. You know, we can have these mini moments where we remind our body that it's worthy of pleasure and a, a, a moment where, you know, we just shut everything else out. And, uh, you know, that can sound, that can sound like the ideal and everyone say, well, yes, fine. But when you've got four kids and three dogs and things like that, if you become ill and that's your prescription, you will find it. Do not mm -hmm. wait to get ill before you take those five and 10 minutes every day to just give your body the health benefits of pleasure and calm and reminding it that it's valuable yeah invaluable it's yes. invaluable isn't it it's the most the most extraordinary miraculous thing isn't it that we and it's where we live mm. and I loved what you said about the nitric oxide and I think if correct me if I'm wrong did you mention that it's what makes 
fireflies. Yeah, yeah. Glow. It's, the, it's, the, it's the chemical compound that gives fireflies their glow. So if we oh. we have that same compound in us, we have that same ability to reignite our spark and our glow that we all want, that we're all buying creams for and books for and oh you know I'm trying to do this I'm trying to do that and again we can get that same light back by bringing in these things that don't even have to cost any money they can be like sitting in your garden on the grass and taking some deep breaths they can be calling your friend who just makes you belly laugh that notion of bringing pleasure back into your life that women are so starved of is better than most pills that are being dished out for mental and physical Mm. problems to women right now it's so true. I remember coaching um, a lady in her 50s who works for the NHS and she just, she didn't have a minute, you know, not even a minute mm. in the day. Mm. She was so overwhelmed with admin and this and that. And when I asked her to write down what kind of made her feel light, you know, if if she had time, if I could give her an hour, what would she do with it? And the thing she wrote down was so simple. You know, it wasn't mm. going to a spa day. No in or going to Paris for Mm -hmm. for breakfast it was literally sitting having a cup of tea in a a special cup and just Mm -hmm. enjoying the cup of tea Mm -hmm. and playing with her dog that that was that was all and actually once Mm -hmm. she started doing those things she immediately felt you know it gave that little chink Mm -hmm. of light where she Mm -hmm. felt she just felt lighter you know, to say these are things that don't cost any money and they're so yeah. accessible and yet we don't allow ourselves even that minute to enjoy no. them. And lots of us have had that role modelled to us by our parents, yeah. by our aunts, by other women around us. We've had it role modelled that you don't have a minute. We've had that message of you don't sit down, oh, haven't sat down all day and we celebrate those people who are busy and we, you know, one of my biggest things is we celebrate people in their obituaries And it says, you know, this woman did everything for everyone. And I look at the age in some of those obituaries and I think, I wonder if that age wouldn't have been so young had she not given everything to everyone and nothing to herself. You know, it's true. Yeah. It's seen as such as such a wonderful mark of being a successful woman, isn't it? And often I'll I'll chat to women and they'll say things like, as long as everyone else is all right. You know, my, my heart kind of sinks because I can see yeah. that they're not all right and they actually yeah. need to be doing a lot more to look after their own well-being. Yeah. But it, it's like, well, I'll get to my own well-being when, you know, Sophie's done her GCSEs or, you know, and so on and so Tim's taking yeah. his piano exam. You know, there's always there's always something um, going on. But it's it's the focus is so entirely on everyone else. As long as they're all right, I'm all right. Well, that's yeah. actually not the case at all Mm. is it Mm. and it's really bad role modeling for your siblings um not for your siblings for your children because yeah you're 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 saying that this is what makes a wonderful mother like it's wonderful if you have no time for yourself it's wonderful if at the end of the day you sink into bed and all you've done is serve everyone else and meet everyone else's needs and it's not wonderful it's really dangerous you know most women never run the risk of becoming selfish people who just do stuff for themselves no it's not going to happen it's literally impossible for 99 percent of women yet women have this fear of like oh but that would be selfish if I said no to them you know I have half an hour free so of course I could pick up their children or of course I could do that because I have half an hour free on my day so of course it's there to be filled with someone else's need and yet when we realize no those those times those moments are not to be feel filled they're your time to recharge they're your time to catch your breath they're your time to take your medicine which is like you said for that woman it was her cup of tea in a moment with her Mm. dog for Mm. another woman it it might be just having 15 minutes of that terrible tv show she loves you know we we have these antidepressants in our lives that are not prescribed by our doctors and many of us refuse to take them because we don't believe we're worth it you know yeah it's so, I, I, I think that what you've just said just needs to be internalized by every woman, I think, that who I've ever met, because yeah. there is that grappling with, um, you know, am I worth it? Do I deserve to 
sit down um, mm-hmm. and just be for, for five minutes or 15 minutes. And you talk um, in the book about the energy bank, which is something that, oh goodness, I remember when I first learned about this concept and I'm horrified to say I was in my mid forties. I was actually at a talk by um, Mark Hyman in London and he just explained this very simple concept. And I remember like, like I was so shocked that I almost <laughs> dropped my pen. <laughs> And, and, and I just thought, oh, put, take energy out, I have to put it in. And he was saying that he, you know, he was giving, he'd given a whole day's talk yesterday. So then he'd gone for a run and had a massage. And I was thinking, had a massage? I know, the cheek of it. The, what? <laughs> I was thinking like, okay, me as a woman, if it was my birthday, okay, fine. Yeah. He, had, he had a massage after giving... <laughs> After giving a talk, I how was dare just he? absolutely, well, I wasn't, I wasn't, I, I wasn't thinking how dare he, but I was just no, I know. staggered that yeah. you should like indulge in such a thing. Um, and I think that since I have understood that, it has been definitely groundbreaking for me. And I know when I go overboard, like if I think a few days ago, I had a face-to-face um, client who was having an anxiety attack actually with me Um help them through that and then immediately we went to do an Instagram live I was a guest on Instagram live talking about I don't know how to make habits stick and then immediately I gave a corporate webinar on sleep that was 90 minutes I was talking 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 Mm -hmm. and giving and I loved all of them because I love all of those things um and I did them all well very well Mm -hmm. but it was too much to do in one morning <laughs> it was yeah. too much and at the end of it um I, I said to my husband I said I'm I'm just I'm just done in I'm actually mm. I know that I've gone way too far and I feel it wasn't kind of like a yawning tiredness but it was kind of like you feel like everything's just been sucked out of you and I actually mm-hmm. just lay um we had a camping hammock up in the garden and I literally just lay there Mm-hmm. And I thought, you know, whatever else, I, I I can't do anything more today. I've gone way overboard. And actually, even the next day, I, yeah. I felt it. So I know that I have to be much more careful it, with my diary. And I can't, yeah. can't expect of myself to give out that much without taking a break in between. No, and at different points in your cycle, it will affect you more. So if you'd have done all that when you're kind of in your kind of spring phase, which is follicular or your summer phase, which is ovulatory, you'd have more of those, you'd have more testosterone, you'd have more of those up feeling hormones that would actually help get you through that. If you were doing that in the week before your period or the start of your period or on your period, that will take your body a lot more, a lot longer to recover on because you don't actually have those energetic hormones there to help you through that. So I always say to women, you can do anything at any time of the month, but at different times, it will affect you more. So if you want to run a marathon on your period, you can do that. You have the capability. Mm -hmm. It's not the best for your body, but your body will still let you do that. But it means you'll need a week to recover instead of a day or two weeks to recover instead of two days, you know, where it would, if you were ovulating, your, your body would bounce back quicker. So it's just that awareness as well, if we can push our body But if we push our body when we don't have those supporting hormones, then a few days later when we wonder why we feel brain foggy or we've got migraines or if we just feel like terrible, often we won't relate it to that day where we pushed ourselves too much and they're completely related. Yeah, but we just never joined the dots. I mean, I never joined the dots. So talk us through, we've talked a little bit about menstruating. Can you just guide us through the other parts of the month and what we can kind of expect of ourselves and not expect of ourselves. Yeah, sure. So you have your period, which like I said, it's like the phase of winter. It's kind of a mm-hmm. hunkering downtime, your energy levels, your your, your mood is very low. Um, and, and I'll just say before we move on, the interesting thing about me saying your mood is low, I mean that in relation to what's expected of women. So a lowered mood, there's nothing wrong with it. But because we've been told, no, no, you have to be happy, upbeat, on show, there for everyone else's needs, what feels like a lowered mood to you or them is very normal. It's your winter. Like no one goes outside in winter and is like, oh, 
thanks earth you with your low mood we just understand it's winter so we allow the gray clouds and the gray sky and so sometimes we need to give ourselves such understanding to go oh my mood is lower but my energy is lower and 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 I need time on my own so if I don't get that then I will see those things of a short temporal things like that but that's very normal for this season so after after your period you then uh, move into your follicular phase which is the same as springtime and it's where within your body what's happening is your body is actually forming new follicles ready for the next month so those follicles have the potential of new life so this feeling of spring is very present in our body and our brain chemistry and it's the time in our month where we want to do something new where our lives can feel very boring or very just oh, I need to change something in my bedroom or my exercise regime or my business because what our brain chemistry is really good at at that time, the hormones make you really good at like brainstorming and thinking of something new to do because within the month, your body wants you to uh, have almost like a pregnancy stage, a birthing stage, a kind of postnatal stage and a like winter stage kind of after that where you hunker down so this 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 idea is this like a pregnancy and a kind of what shall I birth this month so if you in that phase because that's what your body is urging you to your body is reminding you that there's new stuff being brewed within you if you carry on having the same dinners that you've had for the last week and doing the same maybe watching the same tv show with your partner and you'll start to feel really frustrated. It's the week where you'll be like, I hate my life. It's so boring. It's probably, you know, it's where you'll be looking at on Instagram. Oh, everyone else is doing this and that. And I just do nothing new and I'm sick of it. And that's a really good thing. It's just your body nudging you to say, bring something new in. Walk a different route to that or try a different recipe or... um don't see your partner tonight, go and see a friend or start that course you want to start. You know, your body is, those those frustrations and those angsts are always nudges. What your body is trying to do, it's trying to nudge you to more health and to a life that you know you want. So like I said, those, those kind of little frustrations are a really lovely sign each month from your body just saying, I know you want to do something new. You're a woman. You're this cyclical creature that every month wants to create and birth something new. So let's do something new. You know, let's if you're always watching crime drama, let's watch comedy. It doesn't it doesn't have to be that you have to repaint your whole house and find a new partner. You know, that's up to you if that's what you'd like to do during that time of the month. But it might change in your next hormonal season. But just do something. Just do something different. Like I said, just do one recipe different or just wear earrings if you never wear earrings or it's just these little things that bring our body so much joy because we're working with what our body and brain chemistry is asking us to do so that's that's the lovely spring season that we're in we then move into summer which is our ovulatory phase it's when all those hormones all those up hormones are increasing you will naturally have more energy you will have your brain will want to be around people because your brain chemistry makes you very good at communicating at that time. So if you can pick when you're doing a presentation or a talk or something like that, that's a lovely time to be able to do it. Again, you can do it at any time of the month, but when you're ovulating is when your hormones are really supporting you for communication, for being around people, for giving out. You can literally do double, triple naturally and it not affect your health than you can do when you're on your period and I always say to women but it's really it's also really dangerous because you have this idea of like I want to see people I want to be around people you'll you know you should have a natural kind of lift in your libido it's also when you'll kind of text everyone and be like I miss you I haven't seen you for so long let's meet up next week when are you free and it's just this oh I just want to be around people and socializing however your hormones then shift and you head into your luteal phase, which is autumn. And those hormones that have wanted to be around people and have that summer, you know, extroverted energy, they're starting to decline. And as they decline, your body goes, oh, I actually, in the same way with autumn, you start that hunker down, you start that idea of a big chunky cardigan on. 
that's what happens to you socially and emotionally. You think, oh, I'm not sure I want to be around as many people. I look, you might look at your diary and think, oh, God, I've booked in seeing people every day. And that feels a bit much for me, actually. So being aware of that, you'll go, you know what? It would be best if out of these five days where I'm meeting five different people for coffee, I probably need to cancel two or three of those to make sure that I don't have that overwhelm, that emotional crash, the PMT that's likely to come on. Because like mm. I said, that that PMT phase, which is in this autumn luteal phase, is about you not honouring the needs of your body. So okay. you just have to be really careful when those shifts happen to say, of course you can do it. But if you meet up for a big social event the day or a couple of days before your period, it's going to you're going to have to use a lot of extra energy to socialize, to chat with people, to be upbeat. And then the downside of that is it will take you longer to recover. So you'll feel absolutely exhausted from a social event that in your spring or summer phase wouldn't have bothered you at all. Mm. OK, and I think what I think would be news to a lot of women is a lot of what you have explained very beautifully in the book is that a lot of problems that women experience around PMT or painful periods or so on, you know, lots of really awful stuff that women go mm -hmm. through are actually rooted in things that we are doing around our own lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. It's, if you have really bad PMT, it's because your lifestyle isn't working from your body. And I know how inconvenient that is to you. I know how inconvenient that is to your business. I know how inconvenient that is to your family. But the actual correlation between people having severe PMT and struggling in the menopause, they're completely linked. So you can either keep medicating over it now so that you can just ignore it and you can try and keep medicating as you go. At some point, your body is going to have to be listened to. Even if you medicate over it, there's something about your lifestyle that contains too much stress, too many possibly inflammatory foods. Your life is not working for your body. And so those symptoms are there to say to you, this isn't working for me. And the longer you ignore that, the more those symptoms escalate and the more you set yourself up for some quite nasty diseases. Hmm. It's a very sobering thought, isn't it? Because I suppose what we're kind of guided to do is keep the lifestyle <laughs> and just try and try and address the problems through medication and maybe mm -hmm. this one and that one and then trying a different one. But generally we stick to the lifestyle because it's our lifestyle and we're, you know, we're used to our lifestyle and it's quite difficult to break out of a given lifestyle. I know you've done it and you talk about it uh, very eloquently in the book and I've done it as well. And I think it's it's a huge gift, isn't it, when you can break out of self-sabotaging habits, which I didn't realise even at the time were self-sabotaging. You probably didn't either, did you? No, I just thought that was that was the life of a woman. It's stressful, it's full on, it's about everyone else, it's about pleasing everyone else, that's life. And I always say I had the privilege of getting very ill very young yeah. because had I not, I don't know, I know I would have been very, very seriously ill within the next decade or decade after that. And who knows if my body would have had the resilience to cope with it then. So yeah. I had a really, I had the head on collision shock of a breast tumor very young. And that forced me, I had to be forced to make those changes because any idea before that just seemed excessive. That seemed for women who weren't busy or women who had no ambition. And again, that was the message I'd been given. And it was so toxic and so dangerous. And it was so, you know, I felt really cheated, actually, by the medical profession who for 10 years had fobbed me off and given me a different pill for every different problem I had, my PCOS, my adult acne, my IBS, and then my breast tumor. They made me believe there was nothing I could have done to have changed that. And I now know there was everything I could have done. You know, obviously some emotional situations and things like that I had no control of. But every day I actually had so much control over my diet and my thoughts and certain things I was doing that were health protective and continue to be health protective that I would I was told were irrelevant 
and they're not irrelevant. Your diet is not irrelevant. Your thoughts are not irrelevant. The stress in your business is not irrelevant. The the idea of getting disease is not a potluck thing. It's it's a cause and effect. It's a cause and effect that every day you have the potential to change. Like that should be so exciting. It's so empowering when you understand that your health is in your hands. It's not in the hands of fate. It's not in the hands of doctors. It's in your hands and every day, whether you take that five minutes to enjoy your chocolate or whether you decide to just add in one extra portion of veggies, those things make a difference when they build, you know, cumulatively over time. Yeah. Oof. And um, when you talked about the, the breast tumour, um, I found it incredibly moving because you listened to your own intuition, didn't you, when you were told that mm. it was not anything to mm. worry about. Um, and you on paper didn't really know better, <laughs> but you no. inside you did know better, didn't you? So can you tell us what happened there? Yeah, sure. It, you know, I, I was someone like I believed in God and I had, you know, my own faith and things like that. But I wasn't someone that trusted myself. I wasn't someone that actually thought, you know, well, God will give me a sign or anything like that. And, and I didn't, you know, a, a woman's gut instinct was something that happened to other women who, you know, were older and wiser and things like that. I was only 30 at the time. So I was like, well, that wouldn't mean anything. But so what happened is I um, found a lump in my breast. Well, first of all, I actually had a dream that I had a lump in my breast. And the next morning I checked that area and there was a lump in my breast and the more I've looked into that apparently that's very common many women are given dreams about certain ailments and some dismiss them and some don't and what I'd say if you've had a dream about something don't dismiss it because the scientific literature is there that often women do have dreams and premonitions of certain health stuff so I went to the doctors and I saw I found this lump and yeah the doctor straight away was like oh it's fine I can I can tell it's a cyst we'll send you for you know, a scan just in case. So I went for the scan and that came back fine. And they said, oh, well, just to double check, we'll send you for a biopsy. And I went for a biopsy and that came back fine. And the guy who did the biopsy was like, yeah, you just you just leave it. It'll be in there forever. It's no problem whatsoever. And I had this really just uncomfortable, oof, like as if, like as if I just had some dirt on my body, like some really stinky, horrible dirt. And someone was saying, just leave it on there for the rest of your life because it's not dangerous. And I remember just thinking, but I can't. Like, I'm not someone that can just leave that bit of dirt there. Like, I just needed it off my body and out of my body. And I said to the doctor, I said, is there the possibility I can have this, what I thought at the time was a cyst out anyway? And he looked at me like I was crazy and I felt really embarrassed. And he said, well you can but you know what would be the point and you know like he was dealing with women with you know serious um breast cancer cases and I just felt so silly and so embarrassed and I went home from there and I was like oh yeah no of course of course and as the months went on this feeling didn't go in fact it increased that this thing in my body had to just come out like it just be like asking some you know someone to leave a splinter a huge splinter in your finger that you just feel every day and you're like no that has to come out it can't just stay in there and I went and saw uh, a different consultant and he said we can take it out he said there's two ways we can use something called an aspirator which is probably best for assist we just put a needle in we break it up and we suck it out and jobs are good and and I thought oh that sounds good and he said or we can you know cut it out cleanly but that will leave a big scar on your breast and you know and I said oh I, I don't know and that should have been a very easy option I should have just been able to say oh you're the aspirator but again something in my body was saying that's not that's not the decision you should be having and I was so thankful for this consultant for not making me feel silly because I said to him I don't I don't actually know which one to pick and he said to me well go home have a sleep when you wake up you'll know which one to pick and I was like, okay, <laughs> he was kind of talking my language. That was the, after this dream, I was like, okay. So I went home and that night I went to bed and I woke up the next morning and my body said, you need to have it cut out cleanly. So I thought, right, well, let's, that's what we're doing. Always questioning myself, not at one point thinking, oh, I'm now this like intuitive being. And I just, I followed these gut voices. 
every step of the way doubting myself, every step of the way feeling silly, every step of the way feeling like these people thought I was an attention seeker or, you know, to 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 consider having a, a scar on my breast over, over a pinprick is just kind of crazy, right? So I said to him, look, I just feel like I want to have it cut out cleanly. And he said, okay, no problem. Booked in for the operation had the operation, went back two weeks later to cut, uh, to check my scar. And I walked in there and his face was kind of ashen. And he said to me, and this is like, he's a NHS surgeon used to just dealing with all sorts of different cysts and breast conditions and breast tumors. And he said to me, I just have to say someone up there is looking out for you. He said, because he said, we have to reoperate. He said, because actually this is what they call a cystosarcoma. And he said, It's very rare. We don't see it in women your age. And he said, and do you know the other thing about it? He said, because when we took the lump out, he said, it gets sent to the lab to be cut and checked. And he said, even in that um, situation, he said something was guiding the person there. He said, because if you cut the tumour one way, it just looks like a normal fibroid adenoma which is kind of a normal cyst. He said, if you cut it the other way, it shows this leaf pattern, which is what we're looking for. He said, so there was a, still a chance that it, we could not have found it. And, you know, just to say to a woman, if you've had a fibroid adenoma, this doesn't mean you're in any danger or in any risk. This is a very unique, specific story to me. So if you've likely had a cyst removed or anything like that, I just want to say you'll be fine. So I went in for my second operation. They had to remove more tissue to check it hadn't spread. It was quite a fast growing tumor. And all these people around me, including myself, were just stunned. They were stunned that I'd been given this guidance. And like I said, I hadn't done it with any gun ho attitude. I hadn't every day gone in there going, well, my intuition is telling me this. We need to have, you know, my intuition is telling me it's fine to have this big scar on my breast because this like every step of the way I was terrified of speaking up for myself but I felt like I had no option of listening to that small still voice saying no like ask this question do that and and it really it made me realize that I have to speak up for myself and my intuition And there are many incredible doctors out there that know for certain that women's intuition and mother's intuition is spot on. And but there's also many doctors that will ridicule it and poo poo you and make you feel silly. Don't worry about that. Speak up for yourself. Speak up for your child anyway. If you are sent away with a diagnosis or a medication and it just doesn't sit right in your cells, even a little bit, speak up for yourself because in my case, it probably saved my life. Yeah. Uh, it's just, um, it's such an incredible story. And I think it's such a strong message that we we all have that, that small, still voice, don't we, that, that you spoke about. We all have our own. Mm-hmm. Um, and as you say, we all need to advocate for our own body. Mm. because who else can advocate as as well as as we can um Mm. and it's something I've only learned you know much later in life um because of course you don't when I think when you do feel when you're just a lay person I think you automatically feel that your opinion isn't really worth very much and um because I used to just I mean doctors for me were like deities almost and it felt ridiculous as a PR consultant you know what on earth would a PR consultant which is what I used to be know about anything you know so um I think it's a really powerful story and thank you so much for sharing it it's it's something that um yeah it's very it's very important to know that doctors can be an amazing resource but you are your own health guide each of us like I said I was a kind of party going crazy busy girl I wasn't someone I wasn't a yoga teacher saying oh and I just kept getting this guidance from me I'd never experienced that in my life and I felt incredibly vulnerable and incredibly stupid the whole way through but it was a good lesson for me to say 
not to tune out of those gut instincts. And mm. there, there's a doctor called Dr. Cassie Huckabee. I don't know if you've heard of her. She's amazing. And what she, her kind of mantra is, your life is your medicine. So again, I would say that we are our own best doctor when we're saying something is not right. We might not be the surgeon or the, you know, the, mm. the, the someone along the line, but we are the best person to diagnose that something isn't right in our body. You'll, you'll so often hear women say, I just don't feel it. something's not right. That is the most accurate diagnosis. Like that is your internal divine doctor saying something is not right. And you should take that with as much uh, seriousness as you would with a top consultant in a white coat saying something's not right with you. And so even if you see your family doctor and they say, you're fine, bloods have come back fine, labs have come back fine, which is so common with women, and they're not fine, you have to keep advocating for yourself. Keep advocating for yourself as if you're your own child saying, yeah, but something's not right. I need someone else to do a test or I need someone else to look at it or I need some answers from somewhere else. Like you must keep advocating for yourself because you are so wise. You've been taught that people with medical degrees have the most wisdom about your body. You have the most wisdom. You have the, the biggest ability to direct your health, but you have to trust yourself. So I, I always say, like, even if your voice shakes, say to your doctor, no, I'm sorry, something is wrong with me or a partner or a friend will say, look, can you just think about who I could contact next about this? Because something is not right. Don't just take the pill and go, oh, well, they've said everything's fine. So I still feel terrible, but crack on. Yeah, crack on, <laughs> which is my middle name. It really was. And mine too, I, it, mine too. Yeah. So, and so you're, job you were involved a lot with kind of um well tell us about what you used to do because it's really interesting oh, where do I start <laughs> like I feel like I've had about three lifetimes in terms of my careers I um so I worked initially I worked in the music industry I was uh I did choreography for music videos and backing dancing and backing singing and you know thought I was just, the way I proved myself to the world is, you know, I just become famous and hang out with all these famous people. And then like you, I got into PR and marketing and I worked for music companies and alcohol companies and charities and yeah, and just burnt myself out in all of those jobs and became very ill because I was using them to prove something to myself, ex-partners, my parents, the world. I wasn't I wasn't doing them because they lit up my soul. Well, the singing and the dancing lit up my soul, but I was I was so obsessed with the kind of stuff around it that it wasn't actually, it wasn't that pure, you know? Mm. So I had a lot of fun. I but I was I was fighting to prove myself. And that's exhausting. And your body can't mm. keep doing that, you know? Yeah. And you write very, very honestly in the book about the insecurities that you felt about, you know, hanging out with models and how you felt and, you know, and such a gorgeous, luminous woman as you. And even you felt that your face didn't fit and that your body wasn't the right size and, and you yeah. beat yourself up no end. In yeah. Life. I mean, that was my, to, to be fair, I had the extreme in that I was going for auditions and I was... I was keeping my weight as low as I possibly could for my natural size and shape. And, you know, and then that created a lot of the, my hormonal problems that I had. And within that, when I think back, I was probably like a size eight. And I would go to auditions and be told I was too short or too large or, you know, just awful when you have such a low sense of self-worth anyway. You know, when you're reading the magazines that circle women's cellulite or one roll on their tummy or, you know, it was a horrible, horrible time of women's magazines. And I just I just loved those magazines. It's awful now. But yeah, I would have to go. I would be on like video shoots and I would be the choreographer and then they'd say, oh, actually, we want you in the music video. And I'd be stood in line with 14 year old models as a I was a woman then in my 20s. And I would be put in a swimsuit and I'd be stood next to 14 year old girls who hadn't you know, develop those curves and things like that. And I would just feel disgusted with myself. And it was just, mm. it was really, really hard to, I'd always had those insecurities anyway, 
but that industry definitely exacerbated them. Um, it's changed loads now, thank God. Um, you know, you never you never saw anyone over a size eight when we were growing up. So, but I had a lot of work to do on reclaiming all those different parts of my body and unifying them as opposed to being like, well, that's not right, that's not right, that doesn't fit, that doesn't fit, that's been rejected, that's been rejected. And I had to reunify them and realise there's a reason I look like me. Like there's a reason each flower looks different. There's a reason each dog looks different. And, you know, I always say I learned so much from my dog who she never went to the park. She was always bigger than the other dogs. She always had like a bit of a waddle and a bit of, you know, a squashed face compared to the other dogs. She didn't spend her time in the park being like, oh my goodness, my legs are so short. My bum is so fat. I don't look like that Labrador. She just enjoyed it. And I'd watch her and I'd think, that's the energy we're meant to embody as women. We are not meant to look at all these other species of women and going, okay, I'm gonna have taller legs or I'm gonna have longer hair or I'm gonna have this or that. We're just meant to go, I'm my own breed. I'm this breed of different shapes, sizes, parts, and that's the breed that I was put on this earth to be. And I get, unless I want to have extreme plastic surgery, which I don't, this is my vessel. This is it for a life. So the sooner I come to terms with like, this is my vessel to create the dreams I want, the easier it's going to be. There's always tough times. There's always bad days, you know. And, you know, again, like with women, when you understand at certain times in your cycle, you feel more vulnerable and you feel less happy with your exterior. But that was always meant to be normal because you're not meant to be an object of desire the whole of the month, which again, you've been taught. Mm. So at certain times of the month, your tummy is more rounded. Your bags do get more pronounced. Your skin does look a bit more sallow because that is when your body is asking you not to put yourself out there as a kind of sex object essentially you know which is what women are kind of built up to be and you're meant to just rest in your body allow those bags allow that rounded tummy wear something a bit less constricting and just give yourself that tenderness like I said you'd give your dog or your child if their tummy was a bit bloated or anything like that like don't give all this love and all this compassion and all this see all this beauty and everything else around you and not yourself yeah Oh, and then there's the other side of that, which you talk about in the book, is that we're not meant to look exactly as we did at 20, as we age, because, the, <laughs> you know, everything ages and changes, and yet we fight change. Yeah. yeah. Well, we've been, we've been told as women, we've been told that youthfulness is championed over wisdom, like if you realize all the changes in your body actually reflected wisdom, if you realize those lines around your eyes were just pure wisdom. And if we had a culture and, and, and lots of um, tribes and cultures do exist where th there's tribes in Africa where the sexiest thing a woman has is long, saggy boobs. I'm like, if we could bring a little bit of that over here, that would be great. Because it's this idea that this woman has lived and she's been fertile and she's fed children and what a magnificent creature. Whereas our culture says, no, no, like what is championed is you looking like a teenager. You can have an old, you know, you can have a bit of wisdom, but your body must stay as a teenager. And that is so unnatural and that's so stressful. And there's nothing else in nature which is told you cannot age other than women generally. Yeah, nothing. Nothing. I mean, it's just ridiculous. I think you draw the parallel of um, a tree shedding its leaves and wanting to, you know, us wanting to stick them back on. It'd be a preposterous idea. And it's funny you should mention the saggy boobs because I opened the paper just the other day and on the front of it said cleavage is back. And you had that, that kind of push up boob look, you know, like the Wonder Bra from whenever that was. And um, <sighs> Yeah, I mean, it just, it still upsets me that I used to wear an underwired bra. It wasn't even that long ago. I and know, when I used same to here. take it off at night, I used to have a red mark, like a proper red indent. You know, and I kind of look at it and think, oh, but I didn't do anything about it. 
you know, and now, I mean, I've got a 15 year old and my, my daughter, when we go to get a bra, I was like, don't, don't even look at anything that's not, that's with an underwire. You know, we're not, mm. we're not even looking at those. But I did that to myself to, you know, to get, get that nice uplifted, you know, type look that looks good under a, I mean, Oh my God. And, and who is that insane. for? That wasn't that we're, we're told that that's for us. Oh, women. Oh, you know, we love it when our boobs are that. No, we, we don't. But we've been taught your boobs. Like I said, I just, I want to scream when I go into bra shops. I'm like, take the underwiring out because we don't want anything constricting that area that's, you know, to help the lymphatic uh, flow around the breast. That's so important. That's why women have that feeling of like, oh, my bra yeah. come off and I just want to massage my boobs. That's because your body was not meant to be, con- your breasts were not meant to be constrained like that. The lymphatic fluid, which takes away debris and bacteria from that area is meant to be able to flow freely. And those tight bras, that underwiring, that all stops that amazing um, natural process of your body. And what else do bras have? They have huge amounts of rounded padding. Because God forbid your breast isn't rounded and huge. And again, that's not for women. So we have to start asking these questions and saying, right, you know what? We might have, yeah, you know, we might have thought, oh, I'm so empowered wearing this tight, wired wonder bra. Actually, we were being conditioned. We have been conditioned that this is the type of breast that a woman should have. This is how you should look, because this is how you should be presented to the men of the world. That is the underlying story of it, regardless of what we tell ourselves or regardless of what marketing companies tell us. That underlying story of women having no pubes and big rounded breasts is because it's an idea of they are meant to stay looking young and teenage-like and you're not allowed to grow beyond that point of your 20s. Your body isn't allowed to change. You tell I get a little bit angry with it. <laughs> uh, it's just, you know, when, when you actually spell it out, like, especially the no pubes part. I mean, I mean, what? <laughs> it's just... The origins. And, and the I, thing is the origins of that. So again, you know, woman, you have authority over your body. If you decide that every month that's how you want to spend your money and you genuinely prefer that look, then you get to do that. However... That look was created by the porn industry so that the lighting for the quote unquote money shot could be put on a woman's vagina. And that money shot for men generally watching that video could be captured better. That's the origin of having no pubes. And so the idea that, you know, this is just women's fashion, it, it's not. It comes from a very dodgy place of women having a younger looking vagina, which just makes me very angry Mm. (laughs) and and those pubes those pubes have a reason so in the same we have eyelashes like they're meant to help like we have we have huge increased rates of UTIs and things like that and that correlates with the less pubic hair that women have so though that pubic hair even a small amount helps trap bacteria and things going into your um vagina area it has a purpose it's not not everything in your body has a visual is, is meant to be visually pleasing for men or, you know, the fashion of the time. Some of it, we just have to say, okay, well, maybe I would like less pubes, but I'd also like less UTIs. That's what I say to women yes. who work with me, who have lots more UTIs. I'm like, this is going to sound really personal, but tell me about your grooming. <laughs> and if all of them are like, oh, I have it all off all the time, I can't bear it. I'm like, well, can you bear your UTIs? So we have choices in this stuff. So yeah. if you could just grow a little bit back, you will start to see less UTIs. I mean, gosh, <laughs> your face. Like, I mean, we like, get into this going very off topic, but then of course there's the whole culture of what, you know, young men are brought up to demand, yes. you know, from a very early age of, of girls, you know, at school. So, yeah. oh yeah. my gosh, it's, it's really terrifying. But just on the subjects of organs, you know, you talk about, a particular organ in the body, which, um, go on. (laughs) Are you talking about our clitoris? I am. I'm talking about (laughs) our clitoris. And you know, when, when you first started talk writing about that, well, I thought, well, I know exactly where this is going. Obviously she's going to now then be recommending this or that vibrator. And, 
And actually you took it in completely <laughs> a different direction, which totally surprised me because actually you didn't take it in a sexual direction at all, but no. much more as, um, a, almost as the, the clitoris as a kind of symbol that women are designed to experience pleasure and that it's important that women experience pleasure, not just sexual pleasure and not okay. just at a sexually active age, but at any age. So can you tell us a little bit about the clitoris from the point of view that you talk about in the book, which I have to say was, I found quite groundbreaking. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, yes. So the clitoris, we have been told is just a tiny little bean shaped thing that, you know, we hope someone finds for sexual pleasure or we buy a certain vibrator that, you know, hits it. That is not the clitoris. That is like probably only one third of your clitoris. Only normally a third is on the outside of the body. The rest is inside the body. And actually, if you look at a diagram of it, it's very similar to a diagram of a penis. However, our clitoris, unlike the penis, is the only organ in the human body designed with one purpose, and that's to receive pleasure. Men don't have an equivalent. It was decided by whatever force design created you that pleasure was so important to women that they needed a specific organ just for that. So women have double the amount of pleasure nerves of the clitoris. They have around 8,000. The penis only has about 4,000, which means minimally we desire, we require for our health double the amount of pleasure in our lives. And as we were talking about earlier, most women are running on a pleasure deficit. There is absolute starvation for pleasure in their lives, whether it's that cup of tea, that bath, or anything more extravagant, which they're allowed to want and choose as well. But that, it is a symbol. So it's 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 an active organ, you know, that, that most of us kind of understand sexually to a point. But in the same way, your heart isn't just the organ that bump, pumps blood around your body. You understand what the, the depth of what having a heart means and what that enables you to do and the, the desires of your heart. The clitoris is the same. It has such symbolism for your desire, your need to experience pleasure and what a requirement that is of the female body and the female design and has to be honoured. Because like I said earlier, the, the clitoris and the idea of pleasure releases this nitric oxide. So when you have an orgasm, that releases nitric oxide, but you don't have to have an orgasm. If you're, if you're feeling like your libido is quite low at the minute or anything like that, you must bring in pleasure in all these different ways. The idea of being turned on as a woman is not meant to be limited to your sex life. You are meant to be able to be turned on by your cup of tea. I mean, sometimes that sounds easier, doesn't it? But you are meant to like have the most beautiful mug for your cup of tea and be like, oh, I am literally, I teach women this in my workshops. I want you to have that tea or to have that chocolate. And I want you to connect with your clitoris in the same mm. way that I could say to you, think of your child and connect with your heart. You could do that. Yeah. Think of this pleasure giving moment. It might be a walk in nature and connect with your clitoris, that thing that symbolizes that body's need for pleasure and the health boosting benefits. This isn't some banal, like weird kind of, you know, sex idea. This is health wisdom of your female body. It's designed to keep you in health. But if we deny it of pleasure, we become starved of pleasure, which is why we would overeat which is why we would over drink which is why we find these moments where we'll binge watch tv because we that that appetite for pleasure is there it's suppressed it's ignored and it has to come out somewhere so we look for other ways to bring us pleasure which then might not be the best for our overall health or happiness that is so profound and yet it's so unacknowledged and mm. so untaught and so unshared. And mm. I love the fact that you talk about enjoying a cup of tea or a beautiful chocolate and acknowledging the clitoris. You know, because I think it's important that we stress that we're not, 
we're talking about women of any age. Yeah. So postmenopausal, yeah. you know, in your 90s, it doesn't matter because these, these also the energies that you talked about in terms of the, the women's cycle, they don't, it's not just applying to women who are... No, no, that cyclical nature is still there. And interestingly, yeah. often your clitoris grow, keeps growing, not till the end of your life, but so your clitoris will often be longer um, at kind of menopausal age than it was 20 years earlier. That is to signify your pleasure as a woman is meant to increase as you get older, which is the opposite of what we've been taught. It's not meant to decrease. You're not meant to have less turn on in your life. That can include sexual stuff, of course, but you are meant to have a libido for your life. You're meant to get up and think, oh, my God, that walk in the woods I'm going to do today. It's the it's the same sexual energy it's the same turn on but we've been given this very narrow view Mm. of turn on and vibrancy and vitality and sexuality and like I said it's like that is only ever meant to increase throughout your life as a woman your sexuality your turn on for life your ability to create stuff you remain fertile fertile is to do with the idea of like being able to birth stuff that doesn't go until you die, regardless of what your reproductive org- organs are doing. You keep that fertility, you keep that sexuality, you keep that turn on, you keep that life of pleasure. That yeah. is your role as a woman. Yeah. It's not about drying up. It's not about becoming miserable. It's not about your life becoming smaller. It's only ever meant to expand. Yeah, but in order to keep that power of fertility and creativity we need to be fed don't mm. we and that's yes what it comes exactly back to. exactly whoa whoa do you know I was actually inspired because you have a beautiful picture on the front of the book of you in roller skates and I know you talk about how you love roller skating I used to have roller skates when I was about 14 red ones with a silver flash and this was back in the 80s and we used to go to this place in Manchester where you just go round and round you know to like and they're playing like wham and Duran Duran and, and I have to tell you Sally I'm so inspired by you and your work and your book that I told my daughter about this and we actually found a place not too far away where we can go. So I'm going oh, to take her. I'm, I'm going to take her next Sunday. That and makes me I'm going so to put, happy. <laughs> I'm going to put roller skates on for the first time since I was uh, 14. <laughs> That's a me- So that will be an antidepressant. That will be yeah. an antidepressant for you. But that will also be an anti-aging pill yeah. for you. Again, we look to creams, we look to lotions and potions. We have these things, we have these things we've stopped doing or stopped Mm -hmm. talking about or stopped experiencing that are anti-aging, that we can connect with that youthful spirit because our bodies can age, but we can remain youthful. We can we can roller skate. It's just we're told, oh, you can't roller skate in your 40s or 50s. Why not? Why not? That will connect you with your youth, that will bring you pleasure, which will you know, again, give you antioxidants, anti-inflammatory, anti-tumor properties, all these things we're looking for in pills. You can do that through your life. Absolutely. And it's so simple. It's just a change of mindset. And, and it's not, as you talk about in the book, you kind of dissect the body. Like we think about our bingo wings, our arms sagging, and, you know, all the different parts of the body that women obsess about and are told that they need to, you know, anti-age as if there was such yeah. a thing <laughs> yeah. as anti-aging um and I think it's very liberating what you write about I think it's hugely liberating I think every woman needs to read this book I mean I, I cannot say that loudly and clearly enough Thank so you. where where can people find you Sally because um you are such such an inspiration I mean you truly are to me and to oh. so many others and I think that there isn't a woman out there who's not going to benefit from your wisdom. So That's how so can we find you? Thank you. you. <laughs> um, so you can go to my website, which is mm-hmm. womenwithsparkle.com. That's yeah. where if you want to book in for a client session, it's also where you have the link for my book. You can go onto Amazon and put Get Your Sparkle Back by Sally Beaton. You can buy my book there. Um, I'm on Instagram at Women With Sparkle. I come and go from Instagram Sometimes I'm on it. Sometimes I think, oh, I just need a break. You know, I'm I'm a woman yeah. who stands in her authority rather than someone who goes, oh, well, what about the algorithm? People will stop. You know, I just keep <laughs> my stress levels low. But um, generally yeah. at the minute, I'm on Instagram. So you can find me there as well. Yeah. 
I have so loved this conversation, Sally. I really, really have. And I'm going to continue to kind of reread the book and take away different things and um, focus on sparkle. <laughs> Thank you. Rather than some of the nonsense that we're told to focus on. Yes, exactly. And also how I'm excited for your daughter because some of the information you have now that, yeah. you know, most women say to me, oh, I wish I knew this when I was this age. Mm-hmm. You can pass that on to your daughter. She can now know mm. about her mood shifts and how her body yes. will change over the month. All the things we were left to feel confused and like we were the problem. Like yeah. it's that that's what excites me as well. Women, women being empowered in this knowledge and passing it on to the generations coming up as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we can use there are fantastic apps now, aren't there, which you talk about in the book, where we can yeah. see exactly where we are in the cycle. Yeah. Is it yeah. my flow? Yeah, my flow is my preferred one. So M Y F L O is my preferred yeah. app to track your period. And that also okay. gives you great information about what your mind's doing, what your body needs, things like yeah. that. Yeah. Goodness, so much to go away and think about. And thank you so much. Thank you um, for having it's me. Been pure delight. And I look forward to seeing you what, you know, your next video on Instagram. And, <laughs> you know, it's just um there's so much authenticity um and honesty and wisdom and everything you put out so thank you Sally oh, thank you so much I've so enjoyed chatting oh me too take care bye 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 bye